everyone uh, here tonight uh, for the lessons that uh, be presented tonight. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about a uh, uh, one particular scripture in particular, and there's a, of course a context that we'll consider uh, regarding this, this scripture. But the scripture under consideration tonight is in Jeremiah the 29th chapter, verse 11, which reads. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. <clears throat> now this uh, a verse, like I said, is within a certain context that uh, provides substance to God's declaration in the, in the verse we just read. And that context is the uh, 24th chapter of Jeremiah. And it's a short chapter, and uh, I'll read it. And of course, you know that uh, uh, Judah had been taken away into exile by Babylon, but it begins first, uh, chapter 24, the Lord, Lord showed me, and there were two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord after, after Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. <clears throat> one basket had very good figs, like the figs that are first ripe, and the other bas uh, basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? He said, uh, uh, figs, the good figs, very good, and bad, uh, very bad, which cannot be eaten. They're so bad. As you look down at uh, uh, chapter 29, Verse 17, we find out what the rotten figs are. And there it says, This says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send on them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and I will make them lot like our rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They are so bad. <clears throat> and we'll read more in this uh, verse, uh, chapter 24, who he's talking about. <clears throat> Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, uh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I have sent out of this place for their own good <clears throat> to the land of the Chaldeans. For I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. <clears throat> I will plant them and not pluck them up. <clears throat> then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return to me with their whole heart. And as the bad figs which cannot be eaten, they are so bad, surely this thus says the Lord, so will I give up Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his princes, the residue of Jerusalem who remain in this land, and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. Of course, there were some that fled to Egypt to escape uh, Nebuchadnezzar. I will deliver them to trouble into all the kingdoms of the earth for their harm, <clears throat> to be a reproach and a byword, a taunt and a curse in all places where I, I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, <clears throat> and the pestilence among them till they are consumed in the land that I gave to them and their families, their fathers. <clears throat> well, because of the uh, infidelity of the people of Israel and Judah, God finally sent them off into captivity. First, the northern kingdom was conquered and carried off by the Assyrians. And despite not believing it could happen to them, a considerable part of the people of Judah were carried away by uh, Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. <clears throat> they were exhorted by the prophet to build houses, form families, and to uh, abide peacefully there until the Lord should lead them back at the end of 70 years. But at that time, there was a general uneasy feeling among uh, certain Jews and likely other subjected nations who did not rest quietly under the iron yoke of Babylon. <clears throat> they were continually plotting and planning rebellion 
against the Babylonians and certain false prophets in Babylon worked with them, stirring up the spirit of revolt among the exiles. Jeremiah, on the other hand, assured them that they had been sent by God into the land of the Chaldeans for their own good. And he bade them seek the peace of the city wherein they now dwelt. And he promised them that in due time God would again restore them to their own land. <clears throat> a people in such a position as the Jews in Babylon were in danger in two ways. They either blew it up with uh, false hopes and thereby inclined to fall into, into foolish expectations. Or they risk falling into despair, uh, thereby having no hope at all, <clears throat> and so becoming gloomy, ill-tempered, unfit for restoration, and unable to play the part uh, that God ordained for them in the history of mankind. The prophet had the double duty of putting down their false hopes and sustaining their right expectations. He therefore plainly warned them against expecting more than God had promised, and he encouraged them to look for the fulfillment of what he had promised. <clears throat> and read the 10th uh, verse of chapter 29 and note the expression, and perform my good word toward you. I don't uh, suppose that the church has had a greater need than ever of both the admonition and the hope. Uh, maybe more so now than the early years of, uh, well, let's just let's say the more seasoned veterans of the cross among us. Uh, be that as it may, expectations that are not warranted only lead to consequential delusions. Therefore, we are not to go beyond the divine record. On the other hand, we need to be urged to believe our Lord implicitly and to hold on to his word with a strong, confident faith, being assured that while God will not do what we propose, yet he will do what he has promised. The word of the Lord will stand, but naysayers and modern day prophets both will be found to be servants of Satan when opposing the promises of God by either claiming God has failed to fulfill what he has promised or that he will deliver what he has not promised. <clears throat> uh, both views are false and fraught with uh, spiritual peril. Consider the Lord's uh, proclamation towards his people in Babylon, uh, Babylonian captivity, and by extension his declaration to us today. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. <clears throat> First, uh, let us note that it is comforting to be uh, to the faithful that God is thinking about his own and his thoughts are for their good. This has always been the case from Adam to the present. A uh, comforting thought indeed that there has never been a time when God did not think upon his people for good. He said long ago, as recorded in Jeremiah uh, 31st chapter, verse 3, the Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God is not like man. <clears throat> Although we may resolve to extend some kindness to someone for one reason or the other, we may fail to deliver on the intention. As high as this infinite mind is, God still thinks of each one of us, regardless of how insignificant one may be regarded by others. As King David wrote so long ago, but I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me, Psalms 40, Psalm verse 17. <clears throat> We should take the light that the Lord God Almighty from heaven above thinks on us at this very moment. The psalmist wrote in part, the Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. 
He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. The 115th Psalm, verses 12 and 13. <clears throat> God in heaven not only thinks of you, but towards you. His thoughts are ever directed towards us. The Lord never forgets his own. Never at any moment does God turn his thoughts from his beloved, even though he has the whole universe to rule. He said of his own, I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Isaiah 27th chapter, verse 3. This is a truth that is not readily comprehended in its fullness, nor is it believed as it should be. These people in captivity were likely to fear that God had forgotten them, hence the Lord repeats his words in this place and speaks of thoughts and thinking three times. His words are repeated out of a desire to make his people feel certain that not only did he act towards them, but his thoughts are still towards them. <clears throat> this would be a great comfort and assurance, not only to the exiles in Babylon, but to his faithful followers of today. The Lord thought of them when they walked the strange streets of the golden city of Babylon and heard the Chaldean language that they did not understand. He thought of them when they were buffeted by these aliens who considered themselves to be superior to these conquered people. The Lord thought of his exiles when their sole solace was the solitude of their own thoughts, though Zion lost. All that the Lord was doing towards them was done thoughtfully. His thoughts of a peace and not of evil towards them was coextensive with their captivity and the continuance of it for 70 years. Such sufferings served a more noble purpose than the suffering alone. Jesus said in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 10 through 12, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly, exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, it's good to have a friend uh, think of you when you're troubled and sorrowing. Uh, such uh, tender thoughtfulness is cherished and comforting. Uh, but how long does that last? Tender thoughtfulness, absent accompanying acts, betray, betrays the thoughtfulness as merely a loveless facade. Uh, not so with God. Suffering has a divine purpose. We are to count it all joy when we suffer. The words of James are recorded in uh, the first chapter, verses 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And also uh, a little further down in 12 and 13 verse, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Remember, God has thoughts of peace towards you, therefore, your own thoughts should be those of peace. <clears throat> Typically, a man knows his own thoughts, although he may not be able to articulate them with any specificity, but God's thoughts are not man's thoughts. They are so much higher. When God says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, he means that when you do not know the thoughts of the Lord because they are too high for human conception or too deep for human understanding, he knows his thoughts. He knows what he is doing. He sees all things clearly. 
and knows the thoughts he thinks towards us. He never loses his way or becomes confused and embarrassed. The breadth of his thoughts exceeds the range of our vision and is profoundly deeper than our mind. The psalmist wrote, Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. That's from the 77th Psalm, verse 19. We are humbled by the reminder of Paul to the Corinthians. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 11. God alone understands himself and his thoughts. Therefore, he can say, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you says, Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. <clears throat> what is also clear from this passage is that his thoughts towards us are settled and definite. Now, this is the implication of the words, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. A man's thoughts about <clears throat> a certain matter may differ from day to day after uh, some reflection or gaining further information. Uh, perhaps this is dictated by prudence, but it is a human limitation. Of course, a fool soon makes up his mind because there is so little of it, but a wise man waits and considers. The case is far otherwise with the all-wise God. <clears throat> the Lord is not a man that he should need to hesitate his infinite mind is made up, and he knows his thoughts. With the Lord there is neither question, indecision, nor debate. He is, he is in one mind, and none can turn him. Uh, 23rd chapter of Job, verse 14. That's the, from the King James Version. His purpose is settled, and he adheres to it. He is resolved. To reward them that diligently seek him and to honor those that trust in him and punish them that don't. He is resolved to remember his covenant forever and to keep his promises to those who believe him. His thought is that the people who have obeyed him shall show forth his praise. The Lord knows them that are his. He knows whom he gave to his son, and he knows that these faithful few shall be his jewels forever and ever. God knows his mind even when we do not know ours. <clears throat> we see from the passage under consideration that God's thoughts towards his people are always thoughts of peace. Sin demands punishment. Although all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3rd chapter verse 23, and are deserving of punishment, God has provided a way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. The Lord has expressed his thoughts of peace to us through the gospel of his Son. As Paul wrote, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians, the first chapter, verses 19 and 20. <clears throat> the thoughts of peace by Heavenly Father expressed so long ago found fulfillment in the cross of Christ, his resurrection from the grave, and his ascension on high. <clears throat> It is through the confidence afforded us by the gospel and our obedience to it that we can be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's from the Philippians 4th chapter, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> 
For God said, let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That uh, affirmation allows us to boldly say, the Lord is my helper, uh, helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? It's from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. That is the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. That will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 7. <clears throat> <clears throat> but we must not reject the thoughts of peace that the Lord thinks towards us. The writer of Hebrews issues a solemn admonition. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. That's from the 25th verse of chapter 12 of Hebrews. God's thoughts are of peace and not of evil. <clears throat> God does not have any thoughts of evil towards us. He cannot have an evil thought, especially towards his children, but also to those that are amenable to the gospel. He has made every provision for their salvation. Although he is a God of justice and will punish sin, he does not wish us evil. The Apostle Peter uh, could write about the Lord's thoughts of peace and not evil when he uh, said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's from the third chapter of 2 Peter, verse 9. He has done all that is possible to lead sinners to repentance. <clears throat> Paul wrote in Romans, the second chapter, verse 4, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Well, sadly, uh, most uh, despise the riches of his goodness. The Lord's thoughts of peace and not of evil are working towards an expected goal to give you a future and a hope. God is therefore thinking with a motive in mind. All things are working together for one object, the good of those who love and obey God. We see only the beginning. God sees the end from the beginning. He sees not only what he is doing, but what will become of what he is doing. As to our present pain and grief, God sees not these things exclusively, but he sees the future joy and usefulness that will come of them. As Paul wrote in Romans 8, chapter verse 28, and we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God sees the beginning and the end. He has done all that is possible to induce obedience by man to the gospel of his beloved son, Jesus Christ, so that when heaven is our home, we shall be like him. Apostle John wrote the words recorded in 1 John 3rd chapter, verses 1 and 2, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, <clears throat> that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Our future and hope provided by God is that we shall be justified and glorified. No greater thought of peace can there be no greater glory can be hoped for. <clears throat> he sees the after consequences of affliction, and he accounts those painful incidences to be blessed, uh, which lead to so much happiness. Now, let us comfort ourselves with this. 
God meant in Babylon to prepare a people that should know him, of whom he could say, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We find that in Jeremiah the 31st chapter, verse 33, Ezekiel 37th chapter, verse 27, and also in 2 Corinthians 6 chapter, verse 16. <clears throat> At the end of 70 years, he would bring these people back to, to Jerusalem like a new race who, whatever their faults may be, would never again fall into idolatry. He knew the future and hope he would deliver by reason of their captivity. And in our case, the Lord is equally clear as to his purpose. We do not ourselves know, for it, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but God knows, and in his thoughts of peace and not of evil. <clears throat> given that God's thoughts are of, of peace and not of evil to give us a future and a hope what should the proper attitude of God's people uh, be towards him well submission comes to mind if God and all that he does towards us is acting with a, an object or an objective and that objective a loving one then let him do what seems good to, to him. <clears throat> Our attitude should be like that of Christ when he said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Uh, Luke the 22nd chapter, verse 42. If Christ can say that during his bitterest trial, can we not also say your will be done? Which gives us a future and a hope. Who would not yield to that uh, which promotes his health, his wealth, uh, and his boundless happiness? Well, all would. Can we not realize that adversity may also contribute to our future and hope? In the Hebrew letter we read, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. That's from the 12th chapter of Hebrews, verses 5 and 6. <clears throat> Let our attitude be one of great hopefulness, seeing the end of God, and all that he does is to give us a future and a hope. We are not driven into despair and intruding darkness, but are led into increasing light. There is always something to be hoped hope for in, in a Christian's life. Let us not look towards the future nor regard the present with any kind of dread. There's nothing for us to dread. As Paul wrote, who then <clears throat> shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not be with him also freely uh, gives us all things. Who shall bring, bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's from the 8th chapter of Romans, 30, 31st verse through the 39th. <clears throat> Our relation to God should be one of continual expectancy, especially the expectation of the fulfillment of his promises. <clears throat> In the 10th verse of the 29th chapter of Jeremiah, it says, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you 
and cause you to return to this place. His promises are good words, good indeed, and sweetly refreshing. When your hearts are faint, <clears throat> then, it, then is the promise emphatically good. Expect the Lord to be as good as his good word. Do not, however, expect what God has not promised. He is, God is faithful to fulfill your promises, not your misreading of it. Of necessity, then, one must know what God's promises are by a right division of his word, 2 Timothy 2nd chapter, verse 15. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Faith that is not warranted by the word of God is not faith, but folly. Therefore, we should be faithful, not foolish. God's dealing with us works out our good in every way. The Lord's words recorded in Jeremiah, the 24th chapter, verse 5 are, I have sent them out of this place for their own good into the land of the Chaldeans. By doing so, God was working for their own good. Thus, from day to day, the Lord gives us a future and a hope. It was there in the land of the Chaldeans that the Jews would go to their Heavenly Father in prayer. Jeremiah wrote, Then you shall call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. That's in Jeremiah 29, chapter verse 12. Many of the most earnest prayers that ever rise to heaven come from us when, when we were in bondage to grief. The Lord's objective with the exiles in Babylon, and indeed with all, is sanctification and justification. Jeremiah wrote the words the Lord has recorded in Jeremiah the 24th chapter verse 7. Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return to me with their whole heart. Afflictions have a way of stripping away the veneer of self-sanctification. We ought, by our study of God's word, coupled with our experiences, become more like Christ. May we increase in faith and hope and love and patience and courage and joy. The thoughts of God towards us are that we, that he will give us an expected end. And there's great comfort in that. With the glory of heaven that awaits us, who would wish to remain here forever? We are to be diligent in running the race, but we long for the finish line. Love the Lord's work while in this tabernacle of flesh. And look forward to the day when you will take your wage of grace and mercy. If our Lord does not come first, and we must be taken home by death, we feel no alarm in looking forward to that expected end, for it is not an end, but a glorious beginning. Brethren, when death is past, or the Lord returns, then comes that promised expected end, which shall never end. How wonderful it will be to hear the Christ say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 20, uh, 20, 21, and also 23. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, and here the kingdom prepared to you from the foundation of the world. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 34. Strip me of this house of clay, and I will sing as sweetly as the sweetest notes of the birds of paradise. Do you not feel a longing to be up and away? Indulge those longings, for thus you will be drawn near to the understanding of the text to give you an expected end. And that there concludes my uh, few comments. I certainly appreciate your attention given to them.